Hey guys, Cam here from PhoneDog.com and it's Thursday which means it's time to look back at one of the grandfathers of the smartphone industry once more and this week I have chosen the Ericsson R380 World Phone. As smartphones go, this is one of the earliest in memory. Hardware-wise, it measured in at a quite respectable 130 by 50 by 26 millimeters. It wasn't the smallest, it wasn't the biggest phone around, and it wasn't the heaviest at 163 grams. All in all, it was a pretty regular sized phone, which is exactly what made this quite interesting and unique because it was actually kind of a smartphone. On the back you had a removable 930 milliamp hour battery and inside this battery was a stylus that you could pull out and use because underneath this regular looking keypad with the usual numerical buttons plus directions and yes and no and power, what you actually had was a touchscreen. You flip the keypad open and underneath is a monochromatic resistive touchscreen. So the keypad itself wasn't a traditional keypad in that the actual buttons didn't send any kind of electrical signal. Instead, you had the buttons poking through the flap. The bits that poked through would then press a specific part of the touchscreen and then that would tell the phone which button you had pressed. On the top was a really thick giant antenna which is pretty normal for Ericsson phones of the time and also normal for Ericsson phones at a time was the LED light that continuously flashed all the time. Another hardware feature this phone had was that it had an infrared beamer or an infrared port and it just nestled in the top right hand corner that would allow you to send various information, more than likely just contact information. Now what's really interesting about the display on this model and something that will probably please you nerds out there and it certainly pleased the inner nerd in me was that when the keypad is closed the screen looks like a regular phone screen of the time you would have very basic information like the time, the carrier strength or signal strength and you would also have any sort of little notification icons on there so if you had a message waiting or a missed call that would show up on there. It would also show you how much battery you had left remaining. Once you open the keypad or the flap, then it flicks the tiny little electronic switch and it tells the screen to switch to the kind of smartphone mode. And in the smartphone mode is a whole ton of features and options that's something that you really wouldn't expect from a phone at the time. You had your usual phone settings, so you had the ability to add contacts, including phones, mobile phone, landline, fax, addresses, email addresses, all that kind of stuff that we're kind of used to now. You could input those in fields, you could browse through your phone book, you could also send text messages, but more importantly, you could also send and receive emails using the phone's GPRS sort of signal. And I say GPRS in a sort of reluctant manner because it was more a mobile version of dial-up. You had to input a specific phone number from your carrier for it to connect to the internet. And that's another really interesting thing about this phone. It had a browser. It wasn't full HTML by any means. It was WAP, which at the time was pretty standard for mobile phones. But on a screen this big, it looked so much better than what you had on most other phones with tiny square screens on the front. You also had a lot of other productivity tools, things that we take for granted on smartphones today as well. You have a calendar which had week, month and day view so you could see everything broken down the way that you wanted to and you could create appointments and you could create to-do reminders and you could set these reminders to go off at set times. All this stuff that we're very much used to with the modern smartphone and stuff that we would be surprised if it wasn't there was kind of a big deal to a phone in those days. And considering all it had was a monochromatic screen with a sort of faded yellowy greeny backlight, actually the resolution and the way that it moved and flowed was quite smooth and the contrast was good. And because it was only black and white, you don't need a high powered battery to keep it going for a few days. Now, because it was a resistive touchscreen, obviously you got a little tiny fiddly plastic stylus to go with it, which you would use to do everything. And for most things, it was okay. But the problem with this phone is that if you wanted to send a text message or an email or input any kind of data, the only real option you had was to use this stylus and a really fiddly tiny keyboard on the screen, which wasn't great and still isn't great now. It takes ages just to send a short sentence text message. I can't imagine many people using this as a productive tool to send emails, 
especially if they're lengthy ones, because that's just insane to expect anyone to do it with a stylus and that tiny keyboard on the screen. If you've never heard of this phone or seen this phone before, there's a good reason for it. At least in my mind, when I look back at the early 2000s or late 90s, the phone that really impressed me and the biggest and the most amazing smartphone around was the Nokia Communicator series and this phone came out in the year 2000 and by that point Nokia were releasing the third generation model of the Communicator series and the Communicator series was bigger it was heavier so it wasn't as easy to carry around but it was more powerful and it had a full QWERTY keypad actually installed on the phone there was no fiddly styluses and it had a directional pad so the user interface and the method of using it was actually a little bit easier. This was running a really, really, really early version of Symbian, the software that was running on all the later Nokia N-series phones just a couple of years ago. And although we haven't really seen anything exactly like this after the R380, it did inspire a lot of Sony Ericsson smartphones afterwards. If you look at phones like the Sony Ericsson P800 or the P910 or P990, P900 even. Those phones, as you can see from their form factor, are very, very similar to this, except a lot more modern with color screens, also running versions of Symbian software. So although it wasn't the most popular phone and it wasn't one that you probably ever saw anybody using or even owned yourself, the Ericsson R380 was a very interesting phone at the time because it had the form factor and the size and the weight and the feel of a regular mobile phone, but it was kind of hiding this secret smartphone functionality underneath. And that made it one of the un most unique phones at the time. And even when you look back across history now and look at phones that you can get hold of, this still remains one of the most unique phones that you can see. I've been Cam. I'm at phone dog underscore Cam on Twitter. I will see you next Thursday with another retro phone review. I will see you soon.